of the resources in chat. I will save all them and then I will record the send those out in an email. So thank you. Uh, so have, Rachel, this yes. uh, I would like to share too. This is Caroline Jen from Yilakis Los Angeles College. Um, I just want to share that um, we did uh, actually uh, have a videos of an uh, actual classroom. Um, I recorded it before the lockdown, and um, it was just pure uh, classroom, uh, physical environment. Uh, no, no teachers, no children. Um, it's just a walk around of the indoor and the outdoor. So if anybody wants to take a look at it, um, that's what we use for our student when they did their Eckers assignments. How do we get access to that, Caroline? Um, I can send it to you okay. or I can share with you. I think share probably better because it's so large that I couldn't even send it to my students. I, <laughs> I just have to share it on my OneDrive. <laughs> um, so I probably have to share it with you. Well, if you share it with me, then I can send it out to everybody as well. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you, Caroline. You're welcome. We did something similar as well, where we did record an hour and 15 minutes observation of a child in a classroom. Um, the problem was, is that we have so many other children. So we were trying to get, make sure that we had permission before sharing that with everybody. Um, but it worked out pretty well. And I was surprised to see that um, Siren Films has many, many observations of children between birth and six. Um, in either little 15 minute segments or hour long observations of children at play. Actually, had more than I had any idea that they had, and so um, yeah. Make sure you, everyone knows of that resource as well. Can you repeat the name of that resource, Tony? Siren. And someone put it in the chat. Siren Films. They did the. They. Um, it's out. It's out of London, I think. But um. But they have a lot of stuff. I was surprised about how much they had, and that I actually had access through the college database for free for all the students anyway. I didn't even know it existed there. That's Thank right. you. The uh, Michelle's resource, did that get put in chat? I was trying to find the school that had uh, the two videos. Yes, I put it in under Branches Atelier. So it's, um, it's in, uh, right in the chat. Branches Atelier online teachable.com. I'll go ahead and, and read and put it in there now in case it got buried. And the other question is, is anyone aware of any films that um, that are streamed rather than, you know, we have to share share screen for a video or, do, you know, how, is there any, you know, that we can down, has any companies transferred over to streaming? And they may have, and I just may not be aware of it, but like Siren, for example, you just mentioned, I don't know. Is it so I think Canopy and Films on Demand, you can stream through Canvas. Um, they're not live streams, so I'm not sure if that's drastic. I don't mean, maybe live stream is the wrong word. I, I'm naive. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm learning it too. But, um, <laughs> but both of those things, you can put it into your Canvas shelf, Canopy and Films on Demand. So there's Canopy and have, Films on Demand, okay. Yeah. and and. Generally, your library database will have some sort of streaming service that. That's a good idea. Thanks. I know Videotives had videos that you can stream or, down, or you could even pay for them and download, but that's a subscription and it costs. Four fifty a year. Yeah. So, I mean, I was using that when I was teaching the curriculum class, but I was also paying for it out of my own pocket. What was the name of that? Videatives, V-I-D-E-A-T-I-V-E-S. They're associated with Child Care Exchange, if I remember correctly. Okay. And would that be a one user, one teacher, or can more than one person in the department use it? Um, I think they have different levels of, sub of subscriptions. The 450 is, is an institutional subscription for everybody. And they have some, yeah, some good clips. And they actually have probably a thousand clips. And Patty says Videotips is also available through Canopy. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. 
the only thing with video tips is that they're really short clips for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult to get something like sustained if you were going to do like a longer observation, like let's say you wanted to do like an event sampling or a time sampling or something like that. It would be much more difficult to do that, but they are great short clips. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I was surprised about sirens, how long they were. Some of them were like an hour and 20 minutes of a child at play. Um, and so that was interesting. Siren, do you have to pay for it as a streaming service or? If you, if you pay for films on demand or Canopy, um, then you get this, they're, they're part of those things. Okay. This is Eliseva Gross from UCLA. Um, thank you all for everything you're, you're sharing and to Rachel for organizing this. I, just the quickest question for now. When, um, just now when you said like these, you know, the video tips are short, but great. Could you elaborate a little bit on what, you know, what you like about them? Because I, I find in my searches so far, um, you know, that, that evaluation can be tricky, right? Like what is it that you, you would, you know, makes it for a great um, resource for you? I could, okay, go ahead. No, I was just going to say for me, when I um, am trying to hone in on a specific skill, I'm able to find a few videos that give me that option to do that. And so then we're able to kind of fine tune our discussion towards a specific skill. And so that's when I have shorter videos, that's what I'm able to do and that I have been able to find through videotives. I agree, um, Patty Hall here, that, I, that videotives is good for that. Although the um, the ones from Siren Films are hands down better because they're watching a child through time and space interact with other children, interact with adults. Um, you know, I used one, um, I forget the little guy's name, but I use it over and over again for um, to do a DRDP with students and their materials came out pretty darn good compared to them being out there like free ranging with the child because I don't I, I don't have a lab so they're free ranging with children that they're observing. I have no idea if what they're observing and, and assessing is accurate. I'm you know I'm looking for the the depth of their observation, the the objectiveness of their observations, um, of the language that they're using. But with with this, the longer length siren films I can look at relationships and it, they're real, they were, I found them to be the most helpful of everything that I've seen so far. Leslie, I'm downloading what you just sent me. Thank you. I think that's, that's been a really interesting yeah, point of, this, this, Sorry. Of, of just of the transition to using films as opposed to live observations this last semester was the lens. So the video tips give you really specific like this is what we're going to look at right here, right now. And so if that's what you're looking for, as opposed to the siren ones that have the longer kind of thing, you know, the longer play out of it, but it allows you to, to share that observation then with your students, which is very different than, in, you know, in many, you know, all my years of teaching the class, where I don't really know what they're seeing. They're telling me what they're seeing, but I don't know how to, you know, kind of relate to their experience of it. And so the films actually give, you know, kind of a different, different process of it. Anybody else have film resources they want to share? I, I don't have resources to share, but I did have a question. Um, our college actually offer, American River College, um, and the Los Rios colleges in general have um, lab classes, I guess is a better word for them, um, where we are working with elementary school students and tutoring elementary school students in reading. Um, the, uh, I was just wondering if anybody had um, any suggestions for resources for the slightly older age group, um, or if there's maybe um, uh, another chat I can involve myself in later <laughs> uh, for those classes. Um, for the EDU, I think that group is still in formation. I know the executive group met yesterday to plan their first meeting, which is happening on the 18th. Um, I know that, um, they're kind of like one step behind where we are, but they are 
trying to catch up and depending on like I wasn't sure if anybody was going to show up today and look at all these wonderful faces I'm seeing and I'm really excited. Um, and so I can let them know that this was pretty successful in having people come together so we can have that resource for education um, to be able to have those kinds of conversations for them as well. Because I know Renee sees as much value in what we're doing as for education. Because I know, at least at my college, we have an education class and I want to be involved in those conversations as well. So I'm right there with you, Robin. Okay, no, that's great. This has still been very helpful. I just, uh, I wanted to make sure that I was, um, I, I was asking those questions too. So thanks so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything we... We just want to make whatever time, because I know that this is like, this is an unprecedented time. And if we can come together as a community and whatever we can do to be strong advocates for everybody, let's, let's work together and get that fixed and done. Um, so the more resources we share, the more we know, the more we're able to play nice together and models those pro-social behaviors that we want in children too and then our students. So Rachel, I heard in the beginning you were mentioning the next agenda for the formal meeting. Yes. Being the coffee. Um, do, do you have any insight into a virtual practicum and certification? You know, the teacher, are you waiting to hear? So we are in the process, I know, well, my mind is going in several directions. Um, we are working on getting guest speakers to talk about virtual practicum and how that's going to affect like permits and things like that. So we're working on getting a guest speaker for that. We're working on getting a guest speaker from licensing um, to come in and kind of like as a statewide licensing agency, give us a statement about what we can expect. Um, the CDE just published a document called Stronger Together, and it does have EC in there in the second to last section just before transportation because we're that um, respected in our world. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to, but they do outline uh, ex suggested recommendations for um, schools functioning and one of the things that the larger part of the document talks about as elementary education and we're going to have Renee go give an overview of that next next week at that meeting, but it is available for you to look at now on the website if you're interested in. And one of the things that they're recommending is that um, schools do not let any visitors in outside of um, the teachers and the people who should be there. So parents are not, a, they're recommending parents not come in, anybody else in the community not come in. Renee is going to be reaching out to charter schools, though, to find out what charter schools positions are on having visitors in classrooms. So she's working on that. Um, and then I have been, so for those of you who don't know me, I um, used to work at Teachstone. And so I've been reaching out to my friends there. And we're working on um, putting together a proposal that could be offered to the state to offer raw footage class videos and potentially ver uh, uh, electronic versions of class to be used in community colleges and CSUs for our classes. So that's going to be part of a discussion is how do we advocate for the state to use money to go for that. And we're looking at early childhood and elementary videos for those. So we can think about the elementary classes as well. And so we're going to be having more meetings with them in the next week before our bigger meeting so we can kind of plan advocacy efforts and action items around that. Okay, hey, it's me. Rachel, this is, this is Kate Brown. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get in the chat here for this, but I just wanted to let you know that um, the Commission for Teacher Credentialing is meeting next week. And when they, when, and, and ECE update is on the agenda. The agenda hasn't been posted, so I don't know whether, when in Thursday or Friday it will be, but we'll find that out by the end of the week. Um, Tony and I have talked about it. Renee and I have talked about it. Um, they're gonna also have, I'm sure they're gonna have a, a piece on there about what the public TK-12s are gonna do, but I, we will be asking for an update around early childhood 
um, in terms of the practicum um, and how all this conversation, what the, how that's going to affect um, the practicum work vis-a-vis -vis the permit. Um, but I think that might be another place where we'll find out more information. Unfortunately, that meeting is the 18th and 19th, so that's okay. We'll just have a follow-up. Yep. <laughs> and I just wondered if you could let everyone know the information about the um, meeting on June 18th for those of us that are interested in elementary school and school yes. age. So from what I understand of the meeting on June 18th, I'm not part of that group because my focus is more ECE than elementary, but they are planning very similar to what we did. They're using what we did on the first two meetings as a model for, um, for talking with EDU folks. And so they're planning on getting an idea of what everybody um, needs to focus on, what they're concerned about with the observation hours. So they're going to be talking about that. They're going to do a needs assessment like we did in the last meeting where we got into small groups and talked about what are the needs of our community. Um, so they're, they're, from what I understand, it sounds like it's kind of um, being modeled after what we've been already kind of doing. Um, and so that's going to be happening on the 18th. Um, I forget, I can look up the time, but it'll be on the 18th. And so it's going to be very similar to what we've done, just uh, focusing the lens on edu education. Mm -hmm. I have some local uh, college people who are interested in that and do coursework and assignments around school age and elementary. So okay. I want to be able to get them that information so they can get on that. And I, I, I don't, I don't know, you know, when is the Zoom going out and who it would go out to? So yeah, I'm there, going to tell me. Like, oh, hold there, on. Um, the meeting, the meeting is going to be from 12 to 1:30 on the 18th. Thank and you. they're putting together an even bright right now to send out. So um, I think uh, we also talked about um, having a survey for, uh, to assess the needs as, as Rachel discussed. So um, that should be that should be sent out shortly. Um, there's a, a, a pretty significant list of participants that that will be sent out to. And then everybody who I have email addresses for from these meetings, I'm going to send it to them as well. So you get it and you'll probably get it from multiple people. And they're going to use the survey that I, I'm going to send them the survey that I did for our stakeholders. So they'll send it, they'll revise it and send that out as part of their process. Thanks, Kim. So what else do we want to talk about? So Rachel, can I share a little bit about what we've done at our college? Yeah, go for um, it. it. It's a little bit different and uh, you know, I don't know if it will necessarily um, support, I, I think it will actually support the direction that we're heading in and just kind of the unknown, but we have a little bit, I, I'm from Antelope Valley College. My name's Kim Barker from Antelope Valley College. Um, we, we have actually two practicum classes. Uh, I, I know um, uh, most of the colleges do. Our practicum classes require field work for both courses. So um, in total, our students end up getting nearly 130 hours of practicum hours in the field. Um, so what we did was um, take our practicum two, which is a leadership focus, and those students had already been through practicum one. So they had, um, they had, um, they had at least 64, most of them closer to 80 hours in the classroom when they came into practicum two. And then fortunately, we were able to have them placed and working with children before um, the, the courses or the class classes were shut down. So um, all, all in all, they ended up you know, um, with about 80 to 100 hours each. But what we did was kind of a paradigm shift when that took place. And I can start with um, practicum two, so the leadership. Uh, and, and we basically um, started to think about the, the soft skills that were needed for leadership and what we could provide them and support them with, what, and, and what, which way we could provide them and support them in developing their pedagogy, their philosophy when it came to leadership. 
and not just leadership uh, as head of, of the class, but also leadership in, um, in the way they supported children in becoming leaders within the classroom and what that looked like. And, and so um, there was a big focus on that and, and we had them create um, uh, integrated curriculum based on the observations that they had made while they had been in the classroom before uh, this was all shut down and what they saw the interests of the children were. And we had them begin to kind of create um, integrated curriculum, a big idea that they were going to work on, kind of a Reggio approach, um, and integrate those soft skills in that, what that looked like, what they would do with those, um, where their philosophies were changing based on what they were learning. Um, and then, of course, some observation through videos. Um, but with the practicum one and the assessment, it was kind of um, the same approach. They had been in the classroom. They had already um, assessed the children and, or started assessing the children, observing them. And they're required again to create an entire curriculum, integrated curriculum based on the interests of the children and working with the teachers. So we took from that, had them build on that big idea, bringing in those assessments. So they practiced the assessments, but then when they were writing the curriculum, they had to bring in those um, assessments into their specified big ideas and um, talk about how children with special rights, how they were going to modify um, and what that looked like in the classroom. So they ended up with a portfolio that had their specified um, realm of interest for the children, the interests of the children and this curriculum that had been built on that. So it was kind of like a paradigm shift of trying to find where we could support growth um, and, and start looking at those strengths rather than the deficits that were coming in from not being able to be in the classroom. So that's kind of, where we ended up. And now these uh, practicum one, we, we're actually not going to be teaching practicum in the fall, but now these practicum one, hopefully in the spring, we'll be able to come in and have the hands-on experience that our practicum two had already had. So. Thanks for sharing, Kim. And we're actually moving, to, uh, bringing teach into that. Um, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, teach into um, the um, practicum too. Anybody else want to share what they've been doing or what they're looking at doing or struggles that they're fighting or? I can share. Kate and I decided we're at Semto Colleges. Um, Kate and I decided that um, we could um, really pretty seamlessly move from our full practicum, which is 96 to 100 and something hours a semester, depending on the way it's scheduled, of, of practical work that we could easily shift to our, um, that we could easily continue offering practicum to those students who are employed and employers who have um, mentor, uh, master teacher permits or higher. All of our practicum placements, a, a large portion of our practicum placements are in the community already, um, with some of them being at our two lab schools in the district, but many of them have been community placements. Um, so we will be doing, you know, up, up, upping our game with self video and for students to upload um, themselves doing activities in the classroom and um, you know relying more upon those master teachers to help us with feedback um, but we're feeling pretty sassy about making making that group of students um, um, able to move forward with their um, certificates and degrees of course we still haven't figured out what to do with all those other students who aren't in that situation um, but you know it, we feel like 
for summer and fall, those that was a good compromise for us so that we move some students forward. How will you um, how will you post that in your schedule? Must have a job? Must be working at a placement where they're um, directly supervised by a person who holds a master teacher permit or higher for the number of hours of the class. Yep. Yep. Because it, we were told we couldn't we couldn't have that limited thing. We had to either offer the class to the community or but that's interesting that it'll work at your what college is it? Well, well, we did off. We are offering it to the community. We're off. It's a. It's. Mm, they're looking at it as. You know, we we can only serve students who are in the community who are being supervised by a person who holds a master teacher permit, right? And we can only certify their student teaching if they're doing it. So we are, there is that limitation there, but that would be the same any semester. Say a student comes to me and says, I wanna take the practicum class, but I can't work with children because of whatever reason. Then I said, well, you can't really complete the requirements of this class. It's just a clarification of how they can meet those requirements for these, during this COVID intervention. It, it clearly isn't our, a long-term strategy that will work because we can't require a class in our degrees and certificates that students, some students couldn't take, that question will have to work out, you know, either a virtual practicum, which I think I, I have a hard time with, but, or, you know, or something, uh, or a negotiation with licensing and getting students in and, you know, there's all that. Um, that doesn't go away, but at least for us, this allows us to, probably move forward about 50% of our students. Right, so for instance, we usually offer two sections of practicum in the summer, we're offering one, but since we're a, a three college school district, all the students can take that. And so we're doing that for the summer. Um, and then we're anticipating we will have to do the same thing for the fall. Uh, we don't know where we could place any students, not today. Did you find I think it's that you a great idea? I, I do think it's a great idea. We were just um, told we couldn't make that restriction, I guess. Right, right. Well, I, I, I had to, um, I had to push, you know, I yeah. had to push my seniority around a little bit and say, hey, mm -hmm. we can do this or we can stop um, transferring and graduating students. We can stop offering degrees and certificates. And they all went, Wah! don't, don't say that. I mean, if right. that's your ultimate weapon, then it's a pretty good darn weapon. Um, um, there was something else. Um, it, we, we have about half of our, we've filled that section. Mm -hmm. um, we are, all, I'm also really fascinated by the idea of finding some big um, happy funder who would consider paying the programs to hire our students as employees so that then they could be like they could be allowed in as employees and right, identified right. to that center that that that's a next step that appeals to me more than changing our course entirely and making it a um, virtual course did that you feels... patty did you find that you had to um with your mentor teachers was there uh, any kind of a shift in the skills that the students were learning from them were you able to maintain um, 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 last semester as we modified our class or in the summer? Yeah, um, last semester as you modified your class and then how has that then transitioned or um, articulated into the summer mm. program? Summer, uh, uh, in, in the spring, we, our students had done almost half of their hours. So Kate and I modified with video feedback and same comments as everybody else had. Some of them were really successful and I think students went really deep with their reflections. Mm -hmm. Others not so great. Um, you know, obviously they couldn't plan in practice as much, you know, activity planning and curriculum planning, but they did a lot of really good analysis and reflection. So it feel, feels good, it's over, goodbye. Right. Um, we'll take some of that though, and thinking into the future about how those students who are working with children now can create those videos of themselves and then upload and share in small groups. I really would like the, um, the state chancellor's office to purchase coaching companions so that we can have that embedded through our canvas shells 
Um, that way they can upload video and we can tag certain things in our, we can grade them. I don't know if anybody's used Coaching Companion. I know a lot of the county offices are um, and anyone who's worked with um, the University of Washington and those um, courses they've offered us. Um, it's really cool because you can tag a moment in a video and say, what were you thinking when you said that? When you said, don't jump off the table. What were you thinking? <laughs> what else could you say? I mean, it's as easy as popping a tag on the video and you can break the students into small groups and they can give each other feedback in that way. That's too. so rich. You know, yeah, so, so taking the idea of video, but making it their videos is what we're going to do. That's the transition. I'm scared to death because I don't, I have not a power user on that stuff, but, but I know it can work. I know it can work. So That's the three of us this semester in the summer are going to kind of play with it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm so excited to hear students, the, it's gonna how be that great. goes. Well, yeah. and, and I don't know if Flipgrid and Canvas will work for that. And I'm not a techie. So, but I'm going to tell you, knowing that I have a companion in Patty to go into this forest together is, is, is essential. Um, I, I, and so for all of us that are on this, uh, take a friend, take a flashlight, take a friend, um, <laughs> because it's, it's going to be, it's going to be dense and it's not always going to be easy, but we have been able to convince our, our colleges together that, um, this is best for students. That we know what we're doing. <laughs> well, well, we've all, yeah, we, we always do that. <laughs> I'm looking at Tony when I say this, like, yeah, just. Just tell them you know what you're doing and just <laughs> say it really strong and they go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, ask permission, ask forgiveness is what I, how I'm moving forward <laughs> with this one. Yeah. One or two, I love I, that I, having I, the students take control of that, that learning and that, I love that. Well, yeah. I think it's a both and. I mean, we're really yeah. looking at that we have to move towards this self-video um, in, con in collaboration with their master teachers. Um, because we won't be able to go in there. Um, and it may be, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm the coordinator of the local mentor program, and um, we've had a really good relationship with them for so long. It may be that some of those programs say, we'll let a student teacher in, but I don't know if public health would go with that anyway. So we're having to go this different route, and, and we'll see. That's so yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, I hope you'll put in the chat. informed and share how the yeah. process goes. See how it That's works. wonderful. I've worked with Coaching Companion before, but that there also is a program that West Ed uses for their video. And I'm, I'm, I don't, for PITC, where they're doing their, their the new PITC training modules. Um, and I'm, it might be worth reaching out and seeing what that program is as well. Because it's very similar. It's that just on the spot feedback. It marks it, timestamps it, so you can have those discussions between students as well as um, facilitators. And is it Canvas friendly? Yes, they're they're doing it through yeah, Canvas. So 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 not only Canvas friendly. What I want is inside Canvas, because um, part of the challenge for me is the um, the HIPAA and confidentiality issues. Sure. I know I, going to Coaching Companion at UW is okay, they're a higher ed institution, but they're not ours. And so I'm doing the, right now, unless the chancellor's office steps up, I'm doing the don't ask permission because I know that there'd be people at my college, please don't report me, um, that would have trouble with that. Um, Cause I tried to move it before and they're like, ah, 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 ah. but you know, until we have a better solution, um, I think the University of Washington's probably got it figured out personally, but um, yeah. So I will look into that, Tony, to see if we can get that, because um, I would want it inside Canvas. Thanks. And I see that a couple people in the chat have used Flipgrid. So I didn't know what I was talking about because I'm not that techie yet. Ask me in a month and, and I'll, be, mm -hmm. I'll certainly be further along. Um, but it looks like um, a couple of people have used Flipgrid. So we can look at that as well because that's already embedded that's already connected to canvas but again we need to look at the um you know the protection Always. so when you when you as you move forward with this what um what is 
what is the best case scenario for you for your outcomes? What does that look like for you? Us? Yes. What you do you mean? With this, as you move forward with this, um, this kind of framework that you're putting into place, hmm. what, what does the best outcome look like for you? Um, that, that we um, can teach to our objectives and student achieve the student learning outcomes that we've established in the course that, uh, you know, that we've all agreed to. I think is the answer. What do you mean? Yeah, well, I, I'm just, I, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, as, as um, we look to maintain the integrity of the programs and we focus on our SLOs, we focus on our um, um, objectives, um, looking at assessment, whether it be formal or informal, um, but, but reaching those objectives and you know, what does that look like for you? What, uh, it's going to be different. Uh, the outcomes right. are going to be different. The objectives right. are there, but the outcomes are going to be different. What is that, like, what do you predict that that's going to look like or what would be the best case scenario for that? Mm, I don't think the outcomes will be different actually, because I think okay. that we, we can create assignments and assessments that are pretty analogous to because remember, these students are working in classrooms, being supervised by master teachers. That experience is not different. Okay. The only experience that's different and I think will be enhanced as we move forward is we're going to actually have more in-time touch points of their work in the classroom as they upload videos of themselves. It's, I think, going to be a better course. Okay. Um, and we're going to, you know, Prior to this, we observe them for an hour around mid-semester, an hour at the end of the semester. We give as much feedback as we can, but they're freaked out because we're in the classroom watching them. And so it's not really, it's like what we do, we, we say we don't want to do with young children, you know, assess young children as testing. Well, when we walk into the classroom, I'm a person giving a test and they're freaked out, even though they love me, even though they've had me in other courses. The second time I visit, it's not so bad. It's different. But the yeah. first time is like, I'm just like, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to write a few notes. I'm going to hand you the notes. You know, it's so difficult. I think that our outcomes could be even better. And, and this is only going to work in this way for students who are working full time in the classroom with children. Like I wow. said, this is only a solution for about 50% of our majors. Right. Um, and have your full-time classroom uh, people at work, have those schools opened or they're just projected to be open? No, they're, they're open. We're they're only, some we've, are open. Been, yeah. we've been screening each student who's applied and, and working with each student. Are you working at a program that's open? If not, we're putting you on a wait list. Um, so these are, I think 19 students are actually working in classrooms with a person who holds a master teacher permit or higher. That's great. What, what part of the state are you in? I didn't hear what college you were. Just south of San Francisco in San Mateo County. Oh, San Mateo is open. Okay. Yeah. I'm from San Mateo. But I'm in LA and we're not open at all. We're very slow. Mm -hmm. Well, well, we are very, we, we, most, many programs are not open, but there are programs who never closed. Um, and, and some have reopened and they're consistently opening more and more classrooms. Well, it's a good plan. I mean, I'm glad your districts go for it. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. you can get direct child, I mean, the virtual is really tricky. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, I'm trying to be really optimistic on this, you guys. I mean, I, I'm thinking that what this is going to do is exactly what Patty said, is it's actually going to get more um, feedback. Students are going to get more feedback um, about what they've done and opportunities to um, discuss and reflect it um, that we've been able to provide with the visits that we've made and that even when when things begin to open up even if we do resume see visiting students at their site I, I, I think this piece that we're trying to develop once we are in once we've moved into being competent around it um, I think it's it's going to be richer. And as I look at the things that are in the, um, the 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 pieces that have been put in the chat, it really sounds like people really it can work. Um, 
you know, we'll see. So it sounds I'll be throwing like really myself a on the flat part of this screen um, in two months, right? <laughs> it sounds like, like really a willingness to open up to um, um, reframing and modification of those and strengthening of the assignments and then really focusing on that inter interpersonal and interpersonal reflective practice um, to then support what's happening and continue with the learning. That's such a, so, such a, like you said, such a rich model. And I really think, um, you know, uh, Patricia was, you know, with Los Angeles County, um, I think that it's going to be programs like this that are really going to support our process as things begin to open and we're able to say, look, they've done this and this model is working. And um, these are some of the modifications and the strengthening of this curriculum that we're bringing forth in these colleges to support. I think, I think that's a good point. I'll, I, I will speak to Flipgrid. We, I, other people might have more to say about it. We did it in, within Canvas. We had to, it had to be put in Canvas, but um, they're short. I mean, the students could respond to things like we had them do one on teamwork and we had them do it finger plays, for example, but they are short. I think it's zero to, I think it's one to five minutes. Maybe somebody knows longer, but it's a good tool. And the other thing that we tried, I tried, is um, we got into groups of four and did some storytelling in among, it was among adults. Um, but they could get, I could zoom the meeting and give them their link, their own link. And they could reflect on how they did their storytelling. We actually did a group time that way too, where it was around several pieces around a theme. And it's certainly not the same as working with children, but it was a way for them to see planning a lesson, presenting a lesson, and then not only the group gave feedback, but then they were able to get their own link because I stopped and started the Zoom. I was trying really hard to do the confidentiality piece and not give other people's. Um, so that's a, that, that was another piece for those people who don't have access right now to children and they still want to do training um, with what is. It, it worked pretty well. That part worked pretty well. Both of those tools. I'd love to share, I, um, again, Ellie Seba from UCLA, I, I'd be happy to share a little bit about what we've been doing, but even just on the, what you were just discussing regarding reflection and some of the silver linings of the situation, um, uh, we have definitely seen the, the benefits amid the real losses of, um, of the hands-on field work. Um, and in particular, what's on my mind right now is the, the ways that we've been able to strengthen our, our work with students um, in helping them understand and combat bias and, and racism, um, which I'm sure we is on everyone's mind right now and has long been a, a part of our mission. But, um, but as, as I just heard from folks, the you know, the opportunity to slow down um, has been really fruitful. And um, so one thing that I just heard from a student um, as we closed the spring course um, was that the, even the very same activities that we do um, in small groups and then with a larger class to, to role play scenarios about, you know, talking with young children about different um, the students reported that they really appreciated the breakout rooms in Zoom um, and that the quiet and the intimacy of it allowed them to go deeper um, than they think they would have or that they had experienced earlier in the year with the same, we had a year long um, experience for our, um, for our cohort, uh, our, one of our cohorts. And um, so they could really compare um, what it was like to do those same kinds of activities in, the, in a live room versus a, a Zoom room. And I hadn't, I was very worried about how that would all go. And, um, and it did take a lot of work to adapt the activity. Um, I'd be happy to share what that looks like because it was really, it was ridiculously complicated to, 
give out the role play, you know, it was just ridiculous. But, but it worked. It worked. And, um, um, and then the other piece that, uh, besides the slowdown and the intimacy of those breakout rooms that seemed very effective was um, that we were suddenly able to have more special guests and and, e and evening events um, and bring in people who I would never be able to, to bring into our classroom. And it, it broadened and deepened the conversations around, not just around um, bias and inclusion um, and across cultural and ethnic and language groups, but also around um, uh, early adverse experiences and, um, and working with children um, with special needs in their families. Um, and that was extraordinary. It also allowed us to broaden the scope of, of our student community to include alumni um, to, who could return then and, and not only share their experiences in the workforce in a range of fields, but also obviously continue their professional development with us um, and strengthen the kind of the network. So those were unexpected improvements that I too really hope to um, find a way to continue when we get back to the to live instruction. Um, I just wanted to add that piece because one of the uh, one of the things that I've been pleased to be held accountable to, for by my students right now is what is going to change. How are we going to um, you know how do we walk the talk? in light of, of the present moment. Um, Thank you for sharing that. And along the same lines, I mean, the, 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 in, in, in some of the things that we've lost, look at the participatory you know, dialogue. When was the last time that 37 of us sat down and had these conversations on a you know, <laughs> Wednesday morning? Yeah, we are seeing that. We're seeing more interaction. Um, and it, that really is how the online research has panned out, that the students actually do do more dialogue, um, more reflection. They're, they're willing to challenge themselves and go a little bit deeper. Um, that's what the research has been saying for a long time. And so it's, it's really interesting to see it forced upon us <laughs> and then seeing it actually pan out. I have that same experience, Tony. And by the way, I didn't lose one student teacher in the spring, you know, COVID crisis. And I, I, I attribute it to um, Elisheva, some of the work that we were doing um, on Zoom. They are, we already had relationships, but then we transferred mm -hmm. that. I even had a student teacher who just sort of spontaneously said this, which I have turned and said it to administration, which probably won't work. Um, she <laughs> said, oh, well, I guess from now on, we can't really ever have class sizes bigger than 25 because otherwise we can't see everybody. <laughs> I said, I oh, like wow. that. <laughs> class caps of 25? Nice. <laughs> That's all the boxes because, were allowed. Because we could see each other and then we could go into breakout rooms mm -hmm, and then right. people could come back and talk about what they had talked. And it, yeah, I mean, and, and as Patty said in the chat, we also had the opportunity to sit in on some of those small group, great breakout groups um, or sometimes not, just give them their own time. Yeah. I appreciate that the, the issue of the class size because at the QC level that is a very strong pressure right now and we're talking that the difference between 20 and 40 or 45 which is what I'm concerned about right now as students shuffle which cohort they're they'll be entering but we're talking about you know do I still get to teach that size or 300 students and it's very clear from my colleagues who are teaching the large development classes that the it's it's a disaster in terms of student participation um, even worse than a regular large lecture um, at least to this point you know perhaps people will be really learning to innovate but it sounds like um it sounds like one of the silver linings of all of this is that we're really going to start finding some balance. Um, you know, we've, we, I think, uh, oftentimes tend to focus so much on the technical side of things. 
and looking at more the introspective and interpersonal side of things, um, bringing kind of a balance to our curriculum that may, may or may not have been needed, but nonetheless is here. It's really nice to hear. I'd like to share if it's okay. Good morning, everyone. Of course. Hi. Well, I just want to offer my services. I have been using Flipgrid for the last two, three years to enhance my face-to-face -face courses. And I know how to integrate it into the speed grader. It goes right into your speed grader so you don't have to open up a brand new browser or do anything extra. It's wonderful. So if we want to do a separate training and I've done training for my campus as well. So if any of you are interested, I'd be happy to hold, you know, a 45 minute training on how to embed Flipgrid. And what we did, I'm from Harbor College, which is part of the Los Angeles Community College District that resembles a lot of what Patty did and Kate we had we wanted our students to get a, a more real life world context so rather than have them engage in videos and something passive we thought we need to get them to do videos you know interacting with a virtual audience and have them educate parents and families because we feel that this is our opportunity you know the parents are now realizing oh my goodness you know these teachers are god sent right they did so much with our children so what a better way of having our students reach out and say, look, this is how your children learn, not through worksheets, but through play and facilitating learning experiences. So we had our students create activities, learning experiences through Flipgrid, allows you to record for 10 minutes. And we encountered the problem that a lot of the mentors or a lot of the supervising teachers were not making the transition online. And if they were, they were, trans they were pretty much resorting to worksheets. So we had two weeks in between, which is spring break, and they canceled classes to say, okay, let's figure something out. So I created something called the Wonder Hub. And it's basically a hub where our students upload their videos, and they're all by domains, or you know, we broke them down so that parents and families can understand, oh, science, oh, art. And this is where our students posted their videos. So they're interacting, they're doing circle time for those students that speak several languages. I encourage them, I said, look, let's be inclusive. Include, right, if you know another, do a circle time that's in Spanish, you know, Arabic or Russian. So we have a vast collection of activities that pretty much are available to families and, you know, the community who may not have access to preschool or learning experiences because there are a lot of parents who don't have anything. And we've used it in this manner. And let me tell you, it, it, was, it was hard. Yes, it was a difficult transition, but I think one thing that the take home message behind all of this was that we really saw that a lot of our mentor teachers or supervising teachers that were making this transition, it was hard for them. So our students were having to educate our mentors because they didn't feel comfortable with technology. And I think the lesson here is that we want our future educators and professionals working with young children to not be one trick ponies, right? Who are not just able to teach in the classroom and that's it, who are multifaceted, who you can take and you can put them in a face-to-face -face classroom and they can do well, who you can take them in a virtual, right? Or online realm and can still do well. And I think that's one thing that our students are going to be able to do during this transition, right? that they're going to come out of this with so many skills that they can be able to transfer on. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, is this transition, you know, part of our own discomfort for technology, right? Or is it something that we can say, yes, it's not ideal, but let's be creative and think outside the box and be flexible and teach our students, right? New skills that they can take. And I think that's where, where we're at. So next semester, we're gonna continue with the Wonder Hub. We're gonna find a way to perhaps include kits. So now they would be creating a video through Flipgrid for families and parents, and also hopefully be able to take a kit so that these families can take with them if, if we're not allowed to go into the classroom. So that's our, our little spiel here. <laughs> Thank you. And Lizette, I just asked on um, chat if you would be willing, maybe we could do one of the coffee chat times where you do a presentation on Flipgrid. Absolutely, I would be delighted to. Yay. 
You know, one of the things that we've been talking about at our college is that we have so many amazing practices that we've known for years and years are good practices. And now we just got to figure out how do we merge those with technology? Because it's like, we, we got to bring the old with the new together and create something even better. So thank you for that. Lizette, one of the things that I, I am taking from what you just shared that I think is such a beautiful silver lining is that um, these students who we so often focus on what they need to learn and the deficits they have, um, we're, we're able to bring forth the strength that they have and share them and again become um, leaders in that moment and and share these incredible skills that they already have so for them to have opportunity to experience that and um, realize that even at the low this level as they continue to learn and um, and gain these skills in early childhood education and understanding of the uh, support and process that needs to happen within the classroom they already have so much so many skills um, so many rich talents that they bring to us and what a great lesson for them absolutely and and just to add on what kim said is what i found is that those students who are just natural introverts right who was already uncomfortable being in a classroom setting right and, and doing this because it doesn't feel natural it's awkward really shined right because now they were in the comfort of their own home i'm recording i'm on my own terms right nobody's watching me and you could see them just blossom and come out where it's like whoa these students speak they do this it was just amazing seeing them and then the, again going back on kim what you said and, and patty said is just the feedback that we were able to provide them we were only able to visit them once or twice right and now being able to see every activity it really just allowed for, for a lot more back and forth conversations and dialogue between us and the students. It, it was genuinely, it, it was a, a beautiful experience, nonetheless challenging, right? Uh, and I wonder if in those moments, um, a more authentic acquisition happens for them in their learning because they are able to share. Yeah. So does anybody else want to share challenges or what they've been doing or strategies that they found useful or their fears of technology? Rachel, I would love to hear what everyone learned about themselves in this process. Or if, uh, if we had no cost or money associated, what would we want this world to look like? Am I on mute? <laughs> well, we'd have a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that. I, I wanted to say something about um, the, I, the concept that, the, that we shouldn't, to the best of our ability, however it works for the fall and some people summer, that we see that as a viable uh, dynamic course. And that I think we, we got through this, some of us, everyone has their own continuum, but we got through this semester to the best of our ability with some strengths and some, you know, some areas we might have done differently. Um, I think we developed very close, really, I felt like we developed very close relationships in a different way with our practicum because we were all in this together in a different way. But going forward, I don't want it to be considered an if, you know, if only we had kind of class. And that's going to be a mindset that's going to be a little challenging, no matter how you, you, you look at it, because if by chance you're going ahead and you actually don't have children, 
for your practicum students. Um, they do have families and, and sometimes friends that they're able to do it with. But um, I, I just think, I, I'm trying to remember the name of the person who's, is, it's not you, Rachel, but your um, teammate. Is it Michelle? Deanna or, or Renee? Or the one who heads the, the Tri-C. Oh, that's Renee. Renee, okay. She said that over and over again in the larger meetings. And I, I resonate with that completely because I don't, want to, I don't want to start thinking we're going to do a less than, whatever it becomes. And it has to be a more than a curriculum class. It has to be a more than. So anyway, that's just a challenge. But I, I, I think we have a little bit of time. We have some weeks to get our head around it and know that this is as, as thoughtfully you know, presented as possible. Um, although none of us would like to run a class without direct child contact. I mean, uh, so just have to work on that one. <laughs> so I don't know about learning. I think a lot of people just did so well rising to the challenge. Yeah. But now we have, a, I would say, a secondary challenge to, um, to really make a, a strong, viable course under the, under the variables that we have. You know, one thing I think about with that, Patricia, is um, in, my, in thinking about the students that are in their long-term experiences, three months with us, if they don't get to see a temper tantrum right up close and personal in those three months, I think it's okay because their entire career, they're going to have several temper tantrums that they deal with. And as long as we can build in more of the reflective skills and having them reflect on, did I handle that correctly? What should I have done differently? What would I have done differently next time? What could have worked better for that child? And had them really think about it from the perspective of being reflective. i rather have them develop those skills so that the next time they do have a temper tantrum that they're dealing with, they can be able to think on it. And so for me, that, has been something that I've gained from that experience is really understanding the power of that reflection as teachers that we need to, to have. I think that's such a, um... a strong support for these students. I, I, I can't even put, put it into words how, how important I feel that that is. And I think we often miss that in, in our courses, our classes. And I, um, as we've gone through this process, and you know, I, I don't know if you all have experienced, but just um, the need for support from the students, the extra support they need to just sit and talk as a group um, beyond really class um, or, or the content of our class and how, um, how recognizing the importance of those reflective skills can support them in going through the trauma that they've experienced or that we've all experienced over um, or may have experienced over the last few months. Um, and also bringing that into those discussions. I, have, have you all experienced that? I've had students that have just wanted to sit and share beyond class. Uh, they just needed that support. And um, uh, giving them opportunity to bring in the reflections that, that have been happening for them personally and share among class and how important that is. That's so important, Rachel. I love that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I experienced the same. The, the question that remains unanswered for me is how that will look. Will it, will it look similar when I'm working with students who I don't already know from previous quarters? Because we really benefited from having worked already and known these students prior to the, to the, to the closing um, and the move online. And I just don't know. That's an open question. I think 
there's such a transparency in, in um, our field. I think that that's inevitable. I, I truly do. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, but I you know, strongly agree that, that I'm teaching, I, I think I focus so much on my practical experience, what's going to look like in fall, but I'm teaching um, the teaching in diverse society class in fall. And to do that 100% um, virtually, I'm, I'm concerned because those relationships that, that I form with my students, and then to draw back and, and to do it in this kind of communication, I, I, it worked, it worked really, you know, I would, um, like Kate was sharing, I lost. I only lost one student out of you know my thirty. Wow, that's great. But we had those relationships going into it, and so to start, you know, the groundwork about what it means to teach in a diverse society, and have those kind of collective dialogues, and starting from this place, I'm I'm very concerned about. What does that look like? Does any has anybody experienced that? Do you have any insight? Anyone have any insight into that? Where do those relationships start? We've been teaching that class online for a while. Um, I don't teach it. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how our person does that. But she's been doing it for a while now. Many colleges do. And I and like the Chancellor's Grant for the OER class creation. That was one of the, you know, one of the courses that has been developed. It's just, it's not me. Like I need to sit down with you and see you and feel you. And so I'm concerned. Are you, my question is, will it be asynchronous or will there be some synchronous experiences? No, that course, it's going to be asynchronous, um, which I'm concerned. <laughs> One of the things, because I'm teaching an asynchronous course starting next week over the summer, and one of the things that I'm going to be trying this summer is what I'm calling the rabbit hole. And it's kind of like Alice in Wonderland where they get to choose their path. And so every week I'm going to have an opportunity where they choose to do an engaging experience where we get in a Zoom meeting and we do something, or we're going to, they can choose to do an activity related to it. So like one of the first things that we'll be looking at is licensing. So they can choose to do a bunch of research and look at licensing websites and blah, 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 blah. Or they could come and talk about COVID-19 and what does that look like in a classroom and have a group discussion. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how to build in opportunities like that throughout the, the time that I'm going to be with students so I can start seeing faces and building relationships that way. Yeah, I intend on doing the same thing, offering like a three kind of uh, an evening, a daytime, and another option. And I am concerned about the workload of that, right? And so now I'm doing like triple the, the kind of meeting time and the face-to-face -face time and the creation. And then will they show, you know? And, and so there's a lot of concern, a lot of apprehension for me of going into it that way. I'm willing to do the work because it's important work, but, but you know, we want to be honest about that, right? That's, it's a yeah. lot, you know? Yeah, it is. It's such a valid concern, you know? Um, and I think, I think um, Tony, making yourself available to them is really where it does begin with them. They just need to know. And I have no doubt, just based on the experience of this last semester, that they'll show up. There, there is a need for that support. I'd love to hear more about how it goes for you, Tony, just because I'm also worried about the work and all the additional time and effort being put into it and will they show and find value in it? Yeah. You know, I, I was asking earlier um, if anyone has, what, what people have discovered about themselves. And as we discussed this, um, one of the things that I discovered is that maybe I needed maybe I needed to connect with them just as much as they needed and to allow myself to be that person, that vulnerable person and um, really go in and engage and enjoy these students um, and share, you know, uh, real life things happen in our lives and uh, we're all experiencing something. It's different. Um, I, you know, we say we're in the 
we're not in the same storm, but we're, I mean, we're not in the same boat, but we're in the same storm. And, and I, I beg to differ. I think we're often in very different storms, but we're all experiencing something. And um, I think that that is definitely something I learned about myself is that sometimes, sometimes I need to um, share in those discussions as much as they do. And um, finding that ability to admit that. The insight to admit that. I think we all switched over to this media that we're not used to and trying to struggle through figuring out how do we make it because we're we tend to be people who um, want to do best for the people we're serving and we want to make impact in with the people that we're serving and so we want to throw in every single minute our at our full effort and so sometimes it's trying to figure out where is the balance in that and to know that we were also in the midst of the transition we were also dealing with what students were dealing with not at the same level but we had i mean i don't know about you but i know i was having to learn how to adapt to being at home all day all the time in front of a screen for 12 hours a day feeling Homes very stressed and yeah I, and homeschooling i have a, a six-year-old and a nine-year-old and homeschooling yeah. them at the same time you know so yeah everybody's lives have been in turmoil yeah and I think it's just sharing that. That's where that connection starts, being real about it, being transparent. Sure. How many people are going, um, know that they're going directly online or that they may have some face-to-face? -face? Do we know yet? Hi, uh, Melissa Size Bakersfield College. Um, my lab class is going to be a hybrid. The first eight weeks are going to be face to face, 20 students in class, 20 students zooming in, flipping it the next week, and then eight weeks all online scheduled. And Melissa, what do you, um, um, what do you anticipate that that will look like how will I mean, do you do you think that that's going to be something um, that will happen for the entire semester? Do you anticipate having to go all online? You know what? What does that look like for you? All? You're muted. It's actually going to look like it looked like this last spring because we were eight weeks in the classroom, eight weeks online. So I don't really see it looking much different. Um, the students were really sent a lot of, all of my classes sent a lot of positive um, feedback having the scheduled meetings instead of just being online. They, um, there was a lot of talk about not feeling alienated and I felt the same way. So it was nice to have those face-to-face -face online opportunities. And I put it in chat. That's what I'm doing with all of my online classes this semester as they're all scheduled. I'm not going to be online for three hours per class, but I'm scheduling an hour to meet with them and then two hours for them if they need to talk with me or have any questions or just need to vent or whatever the case may be. Um, so I'm, I'm not really seeing it look any different for the lab class as far as that aspect. That's great. Is anybody else going face to face or? Hybrid, for sure. Our entire college has gone online, but I will be teaching the practicum course in our lab um, with extreme requirements for my own PPE and hand washing because I have to actually be in there with them moving from classroom to classroom for my supervision. But um, all of the lectures and our seminars will all be online. What are your, what are your thoughts on um, having to go in and, and follow those guidelines? Well, 
Um, I'm, I'm nervous about it, I guess. I don't, I, I'm, I'm concerned that, it, that, that it's, I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I actually have to still develop the plan, present the plan, um, provide that to licensing about how it looks. We have five classrooms I oversee, you know, and so I, I move around because the students can't move around, right? There's no intermixing with the students, um, the children or our adult learners. And so, I, I, you know, I haven't even wrapped my brain around it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I know uh, Becky Green um, has written a pretty developed plan on how she is intended to do it at her lab. Um, and so I was going to look over some of that, but yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the hand washing and changing of aprons and face shields and yeah, well, it's going to be wow. intense. <laughs> I think. Yeah, pretty intense. <laughs> Sounds intense. I, I feel like um, we're in this kind of mourning period, you know, of trying to get past what the expectations are going to be and um, going through these stages of grief almost, you know? Um, yeah, no, I feel that for sure. Yeah, it's, it's exhausting. I mean, really, it's this, like this hypervigilance and then exhaustion, you know, and, and, but we're, we are pushing forward. We have, we have people on the wait list uh, for our practicum in fall. Our, yeah. our lab is opening. Um, our college requires the first semester of our practicum to be um, on site at our lab. The second semester, they can be out with master teachers in the, in the field. Um, so in fall, all of our students will be placed in our lab with the children, should the children come back. <laughs> That's the other whole concern, right? Um, yeah. Since our, our college primarily serves the students, the children of students, and all of our classes are online, Will the families be bringing their children back? That's what is kind of my next concern. Um, I, I, you know, obviously understand that if people are working at home or working out of the home, they're they're going to want child care. But are they actually going to be bringing them in? You know, people are making a lot of alternatives in terms of the care for their own children. And so, if we don't have children, then what are the placements? Yeah. How many practicum students will you have? How many? Uh huh. Um, I cap at fifteen in fall and, and thirty. So you just you'll be there every day. Is that what you're saying? That's what I do. Yeah, that's yeah. That's really the majority of, or majority of my workload. Yeah, is that I do like twenty minute rotations. I'm I'm always there with my students, and so it's a little and bit different. How many than, students can be at your center at one time? Uh, this spring we had twenty eight. Wow, which is a lot. Um, Which, what college is that? Solano Community College. Okay, and then they must have several classrooms, but yeah, nonetheless. We have, yeah, we have six. I mean, it's, it's kind of like six classrooms. And then, so they, and, and we do 144 hours. Um, in spring, we had finished 81 hours before shelter in place was put on. Um, so will the rules be different for uh, campus centers in terms of visitors, so to speak, observers, the, you know, the guidelines for not having people in the program? It depends what, it depends what guidelines you're asking. If you're talking about licensing, um, yeah, I did I reach so. out to our advocate, our licensing advocate, and she did put in writing that the students are, f are fine to be there. Um, but then new questions arise every day. So some of my students work in the field, and you're only supposed to be with one group of children. So if they work in the field, will they be included in that conversation um, because now they're working with two different groups of children and then I reached out and said well what about me because I have to oversee all of the groups of children and all of the teachers you know and, and so it's, it just keeps moving in, in terms of what we're doing but they're kind of asking us you know what what is your what is your plan of action to keep everyone as, as safe as possible you know including myself um, and so we're working on developing those plans and are they limiting 10 children per classroom they are still um, up until July, July 1st, right? And then I th they're hoping to, to increase after that. Um, but again, we, you know, so we do like a, a continuity of care in our, in our infant class, for instance, where we have babies, they stay for three years with the same teacher before, mm -hmm. the, before any transitions are made. Um, we went to open up that classroom and had zero families that were interested in, in coming back this fall. Wow. And so, yeah, well, I, that, yeah. that really is my concern. It's, it's, we're, I don't know that we have the children to make yeah. this function. 
And will you let some people do their practicum at their work site instead of coming to the center? I've, I've considered it, but it's, it's really explicitly called out in our course outline of record that they are required to do the first semester of practicum at the Early Learning Center on campus. Um, and I don't know that we can do the curricular changes to make that actually function you know, this quickly. That's not how the community Lots colleges go. They don't change fast. <laughs> One of my students um, did go back to work during practicum in the spring, and it was very hard to see pictures. They literally made big squares on the floor. The kids had their own table, their own toys, and they were in the square. There were three-year-olds. I don't know how you keep them in their square and what was said to them. And, I, you know, obviously it would not have been an optimal learning environment for a, a practicum teacher either. It would be an environment. It would be different. I don't know. It, it's, there's, hopefully, I, and they've been doing this now for a while. I'm really curious to get feedback on how it worked over a period of weeks rather than just the first few days. First few days, the kids are probably very glad to be back. They limited, this is again in LA, they limited it to only essential workers, children, and then they zoomed to the other family, other families. So it wasn't open to all the previous uh, clients or families. And um, another one stayed open, but the kids were all huddled around a small screen watching a Zoom teacher interaction. It was just the opposite in the same city. So. We do have challenges ahead. <laughs> Certainly, that, yeah, the concept of best practices is a big concern. I, I'm, I, I'm really close with all of our master teachers in the, in the program. Two of them have been in the field for almost 40 years, and so they're really concerned about their own health, right? And they're, they're you know, in, in terms of what it means about coming back. And then the practices, which happens in each of our classrooms that we're teaching our students, is it what we want for the long term? Um, and so we've had a lot of really deep conversations about well, what, what are the needs, you know, what we do with practicum is provide an experience so that the students can best serve the families they can. And so we're in a, an interesting time. In some way, I think we've, we've all come to the terms that this is what they need to learn now, because this is now. Um, and then what will that look like, you know, moving forward? Yeah. Well, even as we move forward, I can't see it just one day changing back like that. It's, like it's going to be transitional moving back to if we do move back to the practices that we knew. So I don't see this as being a short term. No. And it's such long. It, it is. I, I agree, Rachel. I think it's um, definitely going to be, uh, we're going to see some long term effects from this. And I, I wonder, you know, we focus on uh, the support of our students and our programs and if we were to shift over to um, uh, we as instructors, as leaders, um, uh, making sure that as this influx of uh, external stressors happens and whatever internal stressors are happening in each of our lives, um, what are you all doing to maintain self-care? What are, what are your strategies to make sure that your bringing a healthy you to the students. Does anyone have any insight on that? I'm really interested in finding some strategies to make sure that happens. I've been tearing up my garden. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Do you focus on hobbies then? Is that, is that what? That's what I've been doing, focusing on tearing up my garden. Yeah, I know my yard is immaculate right now. <laughs> <laughs> meditation, anybody engage in meditation? Or I know there's been a lot of free um, classes online. Is anybody taking classes? Amita says she's been reading more and listening to her kids more. Wow, that's great. I went and bought a bunch of puzzles and have been doing lots of puzzles. Great. It's definitely moved in phases for me as in as as everything's been changing. So no time for puzzles. Yes, time for 10 minute meditations and, you know, a phase of 
lots of mask making. <laughs> uh, and then right now it's been really um, helpful to focus on what, you know, supporting both my students and my fifth grader as the, in graduation uh, preparations. So that's felt really, really good as a way to, to kind of just offer what we can to these students who've lost, just okay. are so heartbroken. I, know. I, I will say I had a really funny experience with my students. I was still making them go through the process of planning their final takeover days, which we require them to, at the final part of their, their um, practicum, we require them to put together, take over the classroom as if they were the teachers. And so we had them still plan for it and talk through their plans. And knowing it was the funniest thing because out of eight groups of students, six of them planned for baking as their theme in their classroom which is funny because there's been a lot of talk about how baking in general is a comfort for people in times like this and that so many people have started baking. So to see that draw, brought into the students process of planning was really interesting to see. Um, Deborah was saying, I think it's important to think about the children's experience during this time. How can we ensure children have the best experience possible? What recommendations are we making or following? I think that's a really good conversation for us to be having in this last little bit of time, if you're okay with that. Anybody have any ideas or suggestions that they want to consider throwing out as recommendations about giving children the best experience possible? I would just say, I've been really struck that um, the families we work with at, um, at the infant development program in our psych in UCLA psychology department, so that staff and faculty at, at UCLA, um, a couple of graduate students, um, families, but they are so reluctant, even if licensing opens up um, the possibility for students to return, they, they're they really, really reluctant and, and afraid and, and ambivalent about bringing their children back. And, um, and so to speak to sort of the welfare and, and best interest of, our, of the children, I think remembering that the families are our partners and, and the need to support their mental health and well-being and they're there by their relationships with their children you know i i just and everyone's health i just feel like i i gotta really be gentle and let the families guide us in in how in the pace of of the return to the classroom because that's where the children you know are i don't know i was gonna say they spend most of their time but actually they're they spend a whole lot of waking hours at the child care center, but um, yeah, I just add that the parents and families. I would add on to that too, um, just hearing the children, understanding that as difficult as this has been for the adults, um, putting ourselves in their shoes and realizing it's ten times more difficult for them and um, they need to be heard. They need to be, continue to be heard um, and supported in their needs. And that's really, I think, where it starts for them. I'm taking notes of these and putting them in the resources that I'm going to send out later. Anyone else want to contribute?
one thing I'm thinking of is making sure that the teachers who are doing this, that we give them time to connect with one another as professionals to kind of have that time to talk about what's working for them, what's not working for them. Just giving them that time outside of being with children or trying to figure it out so they can have a sounding board. Yeah, I think continuing discussions like this um, where we can come in and be con candid and you know honest about what's taking place and what is working and what's not working. Sharing our um, experiences and our concerns as it unfolds. We're just in the beginning, you know. So um, having a forum to be able to come and and share and and listen and um, learn, I think, is really important. So thank you for doing this, Rachel. You're welcome. Really, it's a secret plot to be able to see all my ECE friends, <laughs> make new ones, and to see people I haven't seen in a really long time. <laughs> well, we obviously all need it. <laughs> we had almost 40 people throughout, well, no, we had over 40 people throughout the whole day come oh, through here. Fantastic. So I think it's well, it's a good use of my time. Oh, much appreciated. Thank you so much. I've got to head out and make lunch for the kids, but <laughs> I'm going to do the same for, for our family. Yeah. Yep. Get ready. We're hosting the Bay Area Regional kind of version of this too. So <laughs> oh. good to yeah. see everybody. I, I can't wait to hear what you all are doing. And Tony, um, good luck with, with your process. And it's amazing. Amazing to hear. You guys too. It's good to see everyone. Right. Now heading out. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much. You're welcome. I look forward to it again. We will do it soon. Okay, great. Have a good day. You too. Nancy, I love your cat. I, unless we, oh, it looks like we're done. <laughs>